TLA is focused on teaching and learning practices that are effective in blended learning um, in K-12 classrooms across the country. And that focus takes you know, a few different shapes and forms, but the work that I lead is really about understanding what is and isn't effective in terms of the practices that are implemented, the context in which they're implemented, and also the folks for whom they are implemented, so both teachers and students. To this end, we have released last year a measurement agenda that really outlines what are all of the things that are still left for us to learn as a sector? Um, what are the things, what are the dissemination points that we really have not been utilizing? What are the competencies that we expect uh, both researchers and educators and other interested parties to, uh, to have in order to help build this evidence base? And then what are the application steps that we want folks to take, which include not just implementing evidence-based practices as we understand them, but also surfacing new problems of practice back to the research community so that the questions of interest to the people who are actually doing this work are being answered by research. Um, broadly, I think of this as like our overall goal is really to connect what I call the research cycle and the implementation cycle, which in many fields, not just in education, but especially in education and in many fields beyond innovations, um, instructional innovations, they really are disconnected. And so the goal is to connect those two cycles. This fellowship in particular, we really want to support the development of measurement professionals or researchers who have an eye or a focus on problems of practice and the application of evidence in classrooms. So we're not, we're not looking for or um, wanting right now to support projects that are solely practitioner projects. Um, we love action research and we think that you know, each teacher probably should be a researcher in their classroom, but that's not really the goal of this fellowship. The goal of this fellowship is to build a pipeline of diverse um, research slash measurement individual professionals um, to build the capacity of the entire sector to grow the number of individuals like this in the ecosystem, and also to build a cohort or a learning network um, between the fellows themselves that hopefully will become well-established during the fellowship, the one-year fellowship, but will also continue to live beyond. Um, and so someone asked me, like, what is your ideal outcome for this fellowship? And I was like, what, a, what an insightful question. Um, I had not been asked to articulate it before, but actually I think that's a really good way of helping folks understand, like, am I good for this? What will I get from this? So I think there are two parts to this ideal outcome. Really, we want uh, the fellow or each fellow to complete a study and to also disseminate those findings in ways that really support the implementation of evidence-based friendly learning practices, like I said, in schools and classrooms. Hi, Justin. Um, the second ideal outcome is really the building of a network or a cohort, and I like to think of it as a learning network um, that includes the other fellows, it includes TLA, and it also includes established researchers from TLA's Measurement Alliance, um, and we hope that this network, network will support fellows during the fellowship and also in their future career path. So, uh, help with problem solving during the during your study, um, help with job searches, right? Because usually the study is the last part of your graduate degree. And so soon after that, you're going to be looking for employment. Um, but also just general professional opportunities, um, helping fellows to, to begin to build, um, you know, a body of research that really represents their, their professional life or their career. Um, that being said, I think I'm going to pause there and ask if anyone has questions about sort of what's the objective, what's TLA's underlying goals, um, and the impetus for a fellowship like this. I do have a quick question and it's just a clarifying question for how many um, fellows you're looking to hire um, or take on uh, because I know of a few graduate programs that have asked me as I kind of disseminate this out to share with others um, that they have a cadre of graduate students so if there if there's any consideration for potentially like a group of graduate students from a certain program that is really centered on blended learning study so um Right now, we are willing or, and have funding, quite frankly, to select up to five graduate students um, as fellows. 
I will say that the idea, the notion of a cadre that's sort of based or housed within a particular program is a really intriguing one. But one of the things we want to do is actually be able to expose fellows to other experiences, um, you know, folks that they would not otherwise have met. Uh, and we really want to focus on fellows that have a demonstrated need um, for this type of support. So we're looking for diversity in experience, diversity in um, philosophy, uh, you know, traditional diversity in identity. Um, but really, we want to we want to create a pipeline that offers this opportunity to folks who would not otherwise have it. So I would say maybe in the future that's something that we could consider. But for right now, I think we want to focus on five individuals. What kind of um, prerequisite uh, experience with research or, or skills around data collection and, and such might uh, a graduate might be required of a graduate client? Sure. And so this jumps into kind of the eligibility question. So I think I'll move on to that section um, after I answer this. But that's a really good question. We are not necessarily looking for folks who have a lot of experience and expertise in this area. Uh, rather, we are looking for folks who are really uh, motivated and excited and invested in developing these skills. We are also looking for studies that are highly aligned with the measurement agenda. So, for example, if your study was going to be an ethnographic study that outlines the experiences of students um, in a blended setting, that would probably get a little bit less priority from us than a study that really wants to. Um, have a comparison group and look and you know take a variable sort of approach for lack of a better term um, in understanding what effects might be. Um, that being said, we are really interested in in like I said implementation conditions and constituents. So if you want to look at a subgroup of students sort of ethnographically in a larger setting where you know there is some evidence of effectiveness that already exists, and so you want to look at uh, a subgroup of students to see if their experiences and their effectiveness matches. That's, that's more like what we're looking for. Um, the onus is actually being placed on the applicant to demonstrate or illustrate how their work is aligned with our measurement agenda. Um, so, you know, that's a, a kind of a formal way of saying, I'm kind of open to being convinced <laughs> by someone uh, how aligned their work is with the agenda. So I don't have really preconceived notions of Want the study to look like X or Y. Um, what I really want is for more of this work to be getting done in the field. Um, so like I said, I'm going to jump ahead to eligibility. If you do have uh, more questions about overview, I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end to just ask you know, any question that you have. So some of the questions that I've gotten in the past are like, what if I'm between programs? Do I have to be a currently enrolled degree-seeking graduate student during the term of the fellowship. So fall, September 2017 through, um, you know, I, I, April, I, we had sort of thought of as the end, but actually we will continue to provide support through, you know, June, July, August, if, if students need it or if fellows need it. So um, I'm, like I just said, really interested in how much your study is aligned with the agenda. Uh, I'm also super interested in who will be supervising this work. So as uh, the sort of fellowship coordinator here at TLA, I am happy to be a mentor. I expect to spend lots of time with these fellows, but I am not going to be supervising the study, nor am I going to be helping um, design the study. So this is not a fellowship where you come in and I say, here's a piece of work that we would love for you to do. Um, so I, so I would want to know who would be supervising. I, I do have an interest in the study supervisor, whether it's a faculty person or faculty advisor, or like say you're doing this as a part of your job, your actual supervisor. Um, I am interested in that person having graduate level research experience. And so a, a doctoral degree is probably preferred for, for who is supervising the work. Um, I also am interested in like whether or not you already have data and participants in mind or if you're still seeking them. And then your demonstrated, like I said, diverse identity, uh, philosophy, you know, um, experience. And so I am flexible if you're in between programs. I got a question like, I plan to graduate with my master's degree this, um, this summer, but I don't plan to start my PhD program until fall of 2018. Like, does that make me not eligible? And so I'm, I guess my answer would be, 
if you don't have a study that you're working on, you don't really have a supervisor, you're still recruiting participants, then you're probably not eligible. But if you're not currently enrolled and you have all of those things in place and you sort of have motivation and interest and in, in investment in actually getting the study done, um, then I would say, yes, you are eligible. Go ahead and apply. Um, some folks have asked what the research looks like. And so, like I just said, I'm expecting the study to probably be already designed or at least, um, you know, uh, uh, designed to be uh, fairly well fleshed out and, and thought about. Uh, you may still be recruiting or looking for participants. That's okay. And actually, PLA does have some interest from a few folks already in, like, oh, can we have a fellow uh, analyze our data? And so if they're in a really good match and we do have interested um, central participants, we're happy to make that match. Um, I'm expecting, like I said, that we would be doing this as a part of some established body of work. So either uh, your degree program, uh, a line of research that you might be doing as a volunteer with a faculty person, might be something you're doing for publication, or it might be something that you're doing for work. You have had graduate training in this, um, in this field. Uh, and then what is the time commitment? What would the fellows spend their time doing? I'm guessing that these fellows would probably be spending 50% or more of their time on, on the research study. Um, I'm assuming that they'd be at that stage in their program where the research is their priority. Maybe not, I'm, I'm open. Uh, my interest in, is in the study getting completed and you know, if you can figure out a way to, to manage your time and get it done with spending less time than that, then that's great as well. Um, for the fellowship itself, the only commitments of time that we expect are monthly um, calls or virtual meetings. So there might be one-on-one, -on -one. there will be a, a number of group cohort calls. Um, there will be no in-person requirement for any of these monthly check-ins. Um, the only in-person requirement is that you attend the Blended and Personalized Learning Conference in Rhode Island at the beginning of April, April 5th. Seventh. And so we expect you to spend the entire time. Uh, the fellowship will cover travel costs, um, you know, lodging, accommodation, and registration for the conference. Um, I'm expecting that really the time that you spend for the fellowship would be a couple of hours per month, maybe a half day on, you know, very, <laughs> very intensive months. Um, but my hope is that you're not actually spending any time on the fellowship that you wouldn't otherwise be spending on your research. So, you know, we're here to support you, to help you troubleshoot, to answer questions you may have, to make connections you need to make, uh, to provide resources that you might be interested in. So I'm not considering the time requirement for the fellowship to be additional time on top of the time spent on your research. Um, does anyone have any specific questions about eligibility before I move on to the application itself? Cool. Um, and like I said, if they come up, we can ask at the end. Um, so the application, can you all see my screen? Uh, <laughs> that's probably what you've been looking at this whole time, <laughs> although I can see you. Um, so the application describes a little bit of that background um, that I shared with you earlier. It finds the timeline. All of the information that is public um, that we've formally put out there is on this page. So you should not have to go anywhere else but on this page um, in order to find the information that you need. If, however, you have questions that are not answered on this page or in this recording, uh, please do email me. And even if you have questions that have been answered, but you still aren't sure, <laughs> email me. I, I encourage folks to err on the side of over communicating. Um, I am very happy to respond to any and all questions about the fellowship. Um, as you can see from the timeline, some of the really key dates, the application is currently open. You are free to submit. Uh, the deadline is August 31st. And then the form itself consists of your basic information. Um, we ask you to upload your resume. There is no page limit on the resume. Uh, and then list the reference. And then there are three key questions, two of which are really the bulk of the application, and then the last one is sort of like a bonus question. So the diversity and the research study questions are the body of your application. This is where you are convincing me that you are a really great fit. Um, and, you know, to get excited about the possibility of uh, supporting your study. 
Uh, the dissemination question is really uh, a sort of open one. Like I said, you can think of it as a bonus question. You get some bonus points. Um, one of the things we are really interested in uh, measurements here at CLA is not just generating, like I said, evidence, but really disseminating it in a way that it is likely to be implemented. And so we want to know, are there ways that we are missing? Are there creative ways that you can think of uh, that will enable you to share findings from your study that actually maximize the chances that educators will see it, will read it, understand it, and then do it? Um, and then finally, my uh, contact information is at the end as well. It should appear, my email address should appear several places on this page. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to answer, even though it hasn't yet been asked, is that none of these questions have any kind of word or page or character limit. And <laughs> part of that is because my one of the my least favorite things about grant writing is like meeting the page limits. I feel like why don't you just let me say what I need to say in the space that I need to say it. Now, as a reviewer, I completely understand, and I do review IES grants, and if it were longer than 25 pages, I would not be able to review. Uh, so I understand that there is a place for limits, but since this is my fellowship, <laughs> I get to throw that out the window. And so what I will say is, please take as many words as you need to be able to share with me all of the critical information that you think is important. So definitely include the things that we include in the question. So uh, for example, in diversity, we say you have to include a description of your need for or the challenges that you have faced in the past in accessing opportunities um, like this fellowship would provide. So have you had barriers to um, financial support? Have you had barriers to research support? You know, do you have experiences where um, a certain group of students that you're particularly invested in would benefit from this type of work. That's what you would include there. And then anything else that you think is relevant. Uh, in the research study, you definitely have to include a statement of your research problem, uh, the theoretical or conceptual framework that you're using for your research design, your primary questions, your proposed design, which includes your methods, your sample, your instruments, and then here's where you would talk about how this study, how you see this study aligns with our measurement agenda, which is linked earlier in the page. And then finally, your intended timeline. Um, like I said, if you want to include other things that I don't ask for, uh, that you think make a compelling case for why you would be a great fit for this fellowship or why your study would be a really good fit for this fellowship, please include those. Um, at the end of the day, I think folks are still going to be like, okay, well, that's not really helpful. Um, I would say I'm not going to give a, <laughs> a, an actual page limit, but I would say, like, keep in mind that I'm going to be reading multiple of these. And so if you can be um, the more concise that you can be and the less repetitive, I think the, the better your chances are of me, you know, reviewing with a, with a fresh and open <laughs> sort of outlook. Um, who can be a reference is also a question that I wanted to address uh, before, you know, folks, um, before folks started jumping into the application. Anyone really can be a reference. I'm looking for someone who can speak uh, specifically about you as an individual, your past experience and your need for this type of support. And then if they can talk about your study specifically as well, that would also be great. Um, I'm guessing that a faculty advisor, someone supervising the research, would make a good reference. Um, this person does not have to have a PhD or any kind of qualification other than they know you well, they know the study well, and they are excited about you as a potential fellow. Um, if, if you have, so another question that I wanted to address is, you know, what if you've already submitted an application uh, and you want to change something? Um, I, I am going to allow it. I'm going to allow one change, um, and I'm actually going to add this, this to the site itself. Um, I'm gonna allow one change to the application. It will be done via email. So please don't submit the form multiple times. If you do wanna change something, get in touch with me. Basically what I'll ask you to do is forward. So when you submit this form, you're gonna get a confirmation email with everything that you've put in here. Uh, I will ask you to forward that to me and somehow indicate you know, what the new, what the change is and what section it's in. So if you wanna, you know, paste your old thing and do strike through and show me that that's fine. If you want to just paste a whole new response and just preface it by saying, you know, here are the big changes, 
that are in, that's also fine. Just make it clear to me, like, what the difference is. Um, I think those were all of the questions that I wanted to get through based on um, about the application. Uh, so this is great. I've only used 25 minutes of our time. So we have a lot of time left for questions that you might have. Hi, Emily. I'm going to put Emily on the spot because she just, she literally emailed me like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and so, um, and, and also, you know, wasn't able to join at the very beginning. So it, Emily, if you had specific questions, we're all friends here. Let me start by saying that. And so if you had specific questions about um, your eligibility or the background or your study, like, I think go for it. Yeah, I guess my question is a little bit about, um, you know, previous research that I that I've been conducting and uh, just I don't know the the flexibility to to work with it, I mean like what's the is there a specific I've read through the the online kind of the uh, the goals the the four different like standards that that are that are being looked at and and what I'm studying really is um, the competencies uh, that's that that area is interesting to me and I've kind of started already building some kind of a measurement instrument around um, the teaching competencies about blended teaching and so um, just wondering if like how flexible this kind of fellowship is in integrating previous research and and using um, you know learning accelerator as a great resource for refining and uh, building off of that and then and, and disseminating and sharing that kind of a thing is that is that outside of the scope of what you're looking for in someone who takes a fellowship like this? Or is that kind of what that's you're a, looking for? That's a great question. So I would say as long as you can define what is the, um, what's the new stuff that you're going to end up with in the spring of 2018, um, mm -hmm. then, it, then it's completely fine to build on existing research. This study okay. uh, doesn't have to be, there's no requirement for this study to be, you know, brand new sort of foundational work. Um, in fact, in many ways, it's probably better if, it's, if it is based on, uh, you know, a line of work that exists, um, especially if you're not in the sort of evidence generating type phase, but you're actually in the like identifying the competencies type phase. Okay. Um, so I say yes, as, as long as you are able to, you know, clearly articulate what, what is being added to the field. Okay, and uh, the other question I had is kind of, um, who who's um i mean I, I know learning accelerator is sponsoring this fellowship specifically but are there specific other um groups or corporations that are kind of behind this that that maybe um are, are looking for anything in particular or or is it very is it open-ended is it is it just yeah i i I'm seeing the, the, these some of these institutions with kind of a, a side agenda which i definitely don't get that vibe from learning accelerator but just want to be clear on you know how that how that fits in with scholarship and being sponsored by people you know sure so um so the this fellowship is completely independently um uh, funded uh through pla so you only have to worry about our interests um and and as you have gleaned from the site we actually are fairly open and flexible Mm -hmm. um, with the direction that the work takes and how you choose to study, where you choose to study, all of those things. Okay. Um, I will say the the uh, Measurement Alliance, who I have not actually asked specific members yet, um, but I do expect to include um, members of the Measurement Alliance, mostly in a networking capacity, and generally this support will probably come during the BPLC. So we will have members of the Measurement Alliance present at the BPLC. They'll get to hear about all of the studies. They'll get to meet you guys. Um, they'll get to hear how excited we are about the fellows. Um, and then there will be time for, you know, more one-on-one -on -one kind of smaller group conversations. So if there's someone there that a fellow really, really wants to talk to about their career, about their current work, about their past in, in this field, any of those things are fair game. Uh, I can tell you the types of organizations that are members of the Alliance. So they're widely varied from independent consultants um, like Tom Clark and several others, 
um, to establish research institutions that are university-based, like uh, the Michigan Virtual Learning uh, Research Institute, who is represented here, um, and who you know, uh, as well as um, sort of non-institutional or non-university-based uh, research institutions like SRI, RAND, Mathematica, um, and then others in between. So we have Roar Saxberg, for example, who was the chief learning officer at Kaplan and is soon going to join the CDI, um, the Chan Zuckerberg Institute, which is, uh, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife's uh, foundation. Uh, he is also a member of the Alliance. So while I can't tell you specifically who you, the fellows may have a chance to network with, that's the group. And at the very end of the measurement agenda page, there's also a list of some of the folks who are part of the Alliance and also reviewed um, the measurement agenda. So you can take a look there to see the, the types of, of folks. Again, they're, they're not gonna be directive at all. They actually have no say in who selected, what the research looks like or any of that. Okay. That's that's great. Thank you. That that kind of answers some of my lingering questions. So, sure. I will say I probably have a perspective. <laughs> you know, I my background is as a quantitative researcher, and so I have been involved in a lot of RCTs um, in education. So I am firmly of the camp that we can learn from RCTs. They are it's, it's possible to conduct RCTs in education. But there is room, especially in innovative settings like blended learning, there is room for a whole lot more. Um, and I am uh, most interested in, in sort of implementation science and, and how do we get, even if it is an RCT that's conducted, how do we get the findings and the recommendations and the things that we've learned from that RCT into actual classrooms so kids can benefit? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Anyone else have any other questions? I know I already. So oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I know I already asked a question, but uh, so if anybody has um, other questions, please jump in. Um, I do have a question about whether or not you have preference for the level that people work with. Say, you know, district level implementation, uh, school level implementation, classroom level implementation, in terms of the the size of the sample that people are working with. Um, just because I know the people that I've reached out to so far with this opportunity, um, they might end up having that concern as they're putting together their study design. Definitely, so um, that's a good question and we do. The focus of TLA right now is really on teaching and learning practices. Um, so I would say classroom school level is probably our highest priority. That's not to say that other levels are not eligible, but we definitely will probably um, have a bias towards, uh, you know, instructional practices, grouping practices, anything that happens in the classroom or at the school level. Which includes, um, you know, all of it. So dissemination that's primarily targeting the competencies that are happening at the classroom and school level, as well as application at the classroom and school level. I was going to say, um, so one of the questions we've gotten are from partners like you who, um, like I said, have a data set or a research question. They would love to bring some of this capacity to bear on. Um, I will say that's probably not the primary objective of this fellowship. However, if we do get applications from fellows who are, we are very excited about and have research questions that are highly aligned with um, questions that we know some of our partners have, as well as our still seeking participants or you know maybe seeking to expand their participant pool or maybe looking for a comparison groups that are not you know that they haven't recruited yet um, then we will definitely be open to matching fellows up with organizations that have needs as well um, but this is not like this for example strategic data fellows project where really the goal is to match a fellow up with a district um, that has a need Thanks for joining, and I look forward to seeing your submission.